This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny, episode 75. Today we're going to chat with Craig Deleuze from Firearms Policy Coalition. On our prank call, Balthazar is looking for a holster, and we'll talk about the magazine advanced release system. Today's panel is Sean Heron, and I'm Ava Flanell. Why is my chair broken? It's uh, like some enormous Sasquatch was sitting in it. I, I mean, the least of my worries, because it's still freezing in this office. I heard you had another co-host last week, and I heard he was terrible. No, he was actually really mm, great. That's not what I heard. Uh, a lot of people wrote in and said that they really enjoyed him, mm. and that... And they said Brittany actually sounds hotter than Regina. You know, I'll tell you this is Sean Heron on Facebook posted and said that Tate was the worst co-host ever. And I believe everything that guy says. Well, Tate's welcome back anytime. (laughs) Get out of here and and break (laughs) your own chairs, Tate. But hey, thanks for covering in my absence. So Manicore Arms, we, we talk about them every episode. You guys should know them very well. Ava, what gun parts did you want to talk about this week? The CZ Scorpion extended charging handle as well as their safety. Yeah. So these are a couple of those comfort parts that we always talk about with Manicore Arms and their manufacturing. These are things that uh, Spin got the, got the Scorpion and he took a look at it and he said, well, these things are kind of annoying. So it's the extended charging handle, which is kind of nice because the one that's actually on the Scorpion, if you, if you have to really aim for it to kind of hit it mm-hmm. when you're when you're trying to to roll fast and the extended just adds just a little bit out there and makes it a little bit a lot more comfortable and easy to hit and then the safety selector is a problem on a lot of these guns that come over because honestly Israeli guns stuff like that Czech Republic guns a lot of them wear gloves over there when they shoot and it's law enforcement and, and military and things like that uh, so they don't notice these things but the safety selector on the Scorpion Evo is pretty uncomfortable and it's in kind of a weird spot so he redesigned that as well. Mm-hmm. Safety twenty four ninety five, extended charging handle fifty eight ninety five, but you'd never have to pay full price. ManicoreArms dot com coupon code is GunFunny fifteen, and that gets you fifteen percent off. Let's get into our interview. Learn the things you never knew on deconstructing the industry. <laughs> We are here with Craig DeLuce from Firearms Policy Coalition. It's a pleasure to have you guys on, uh, or to have you on. We've, we've wanted to get you guys on for a while. Craig, what is your title at FPC? I am the Director of Legislative and Public Affairs. So, which basically means I both oversee our lobbying program, uh, as well as, uh, the Chief Spokesman. Very good. And, uh, coffee with Craig. I know that's something else that you do out there. Yes, I, uh, I host a, a daily video podcast on both YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, as well as you can listen to it on Apple iTunes uh, podcast. Uh, but it's called Coffee with Craig or Morning Coffee with Craig. And we talk about issues dealing with gun policy from throughout the country. Craig, how did uh, the Firearms Policy Coalition get started? Well, you know, about uh, about five, six years ago, a uh, group of individuals who were interested in starting an organization to actually help independent uh, firearms retailers here in the state of California started a group called the California Association of Federal Firearms Licensees. Uh, and so uh, so that organization was born. And quickly we found that a lot of our support was actually coming from individual firearm owners. They liked uh, the way in which we, the way in which we advocated. We weren't just a, show up at the let capital and lobby, but we actually did what we call digital grassroots engagement by uh, utilizing uh, new media and technology to help inform people and then uh, about what was going on uh, with legislation, but then also uh, it, it giving that, making it easy for them to engage with legislators who were voting or making decisions on that policy. So the firearms policy coalition was started as a project of Cal FFL and eventually became its its own organization. Now actively lobbying in uh, four states as of last year. This year we're probably going to be lobbying in a few more as well as Washington D.C. And tell us what lobbying means as applies to the two A in firearms. Well, lobbying it, it's it really means engaging with legislators, going and talking to legislators, testifying at committees, analyzing bills, and writing letters to committees so that they can understand from our perspective, what the impact of legislation is going to be. Now, unlike 
organization, unlike some other organizations, Farmers Policy Coalition does not donate. We don't donate to, 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 to candidates. We don't endorse candidates. What we do is, is that we let people know what policymakers are doing. So if they do good, we make sure that, that gun owners know that they're, that they're doing well, they're voting well, and they're passing good legislation. If they do poorly, we make sure that, that uh, gun owners know that, that they are negatively impacting our right to keep and bear arms. To go just a little further onto that, you mentioned that you don't donate specifically to candidates and things like that. My question then would be, I understand both strategies, or at least I think that I can intellectualize both strategies, but I mean, in this country, money equals power. And if you have the ability to remove the, the flow of money for politicians and things like that, do you have more or less power to have them, uh, vote or, you know, do, do the things that are relevant to your interests? Well, understand this. You, you never really buy a politician. You only rent them. Mm-hmm. So when you contribute money to a campaign, oftentimes, uh, it doesn't have as nearly as much impact as if I can tell a hundred thousand people, if I put those resources into telling a hundred thousand people what that individual did. Well, now of those hundred thousand people, a number of them will then, or that will then possibly donate to that candidate, or if they do something poorly, donate against that candidate. Our whole thing is, is in particular, we don't want, at least for me, I'm like this. I, I think legislators should do the right thing. And then people will support them as they do the right thing. Yeah, I definitely can understand that. How how successful has the lobbying efforts that you guys have been doing uh, been for you? You said four states now. What what are some successes you guys have seen? Well, you know, we've seen in California where we one of the things. And I know a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, California, yeah, you guys have been really successful." I think if you had seen the amount of legislation that gets introduced, the amount of anti-gun legislation that winds up getting introduced on the, on an annual basis, generally we're looking anywhere between 30 to 50 anti-gun bills that are introduced. And that's not even the ones that we're able to kill before they're even introduced by sitting, simply sitting down and talking with, with the members. But of those, you might see somewhere between five to seven actually become law. So, an overwhelming percentage of the anti-gun bills that are introduced, even this, for example, in the state of California, wind up, uh, wind up not becoming law. For example, limitations on the number of, of, uh, uh, long guns or ha- firearms that one is able to purchase in the state of California. They've been trying now for years to limit it to one, one firearm every 30 days. And we've been able to fight that back for the last four years. They fought to try and expand uh, red flag laws here in the state of California for the last few years. The first law was introduced in 2015. Uh, we were able to, it started in 2016 and we've been able to fight back expansions of that over the last, over the last couple of years. Those are just some examples here in the state of California. Uh, we've fought in Washington and Oregon. We fought a uh, new expansion or inclusion of assault weapons laws. We've been able to stop in those particular states. In one, in one instance in Oregon, we've been able, we've been successful in fighting, uh, their red flag laws. Uh, you know, those, and once again, in, in particular in states, or in, oh, also in Nevada, we were successful in helping to stop, to stop them from instituting a red flag law, as well as expanding gun free zones to include libraries there in the state of Nevada. Jeez. Um, yeah. I think so many people just don't want to, you know, throw California out with the bath. And I, I think that's so ridiculous. I'm like, do you, uh, people do not understand how many gun owners there are in California, uh, who are yeah. passionate and patriots. And that's just not feasible to, you know, up and leave their lives and their careers and their professions just because of some bad gun laws. And it's worth fighting for, right? Mm-hmm. Well, think about this. If someone invaded your home, would you just surrender and say, Oh, well, hey, they're coming in and they're, they're, they're stealing my home. So I'm just going to leave. Yeah. No, it's your home. I mean, I was, I've been born and raised in the state of California and, and I'm not saying that there's never a point at which I might not, I might decide, uh, that it's time to go. But I, as long as I have the ability to fight, I'm going to fight. How quickly? So a lot of people are like, Oh, California should just become its own country. Screw California. But what people don't realize is like a lot of times what happens in California, a lot of will set the presence for, you know, for laws that kind of scatter onto other states. How, I mean, do you see that happening where a lot of this gun control is spreading outside California 
and how can states plan ahead and better protect their rights so that they don't become as, as strict as California, the gun laws? Well, keep in mind that the first really big, really big red flag law started in California. You're starting to see legislatures trying to institute uh, magazine capacity limits. That started in California. Uh, There's this thing called the not unsafe handgun roster. Handgun rosters where the state approves what handguns are available to be able to be sold. And then they, on top of it, they then add feature requirements like micro stamping, which by the way doesn't exist, uh, so that you can, you can get no new model handguns in, the, in, in your state. Uh, those are all laws that you're starting to see other legislators starting, other legislatures starting to implement or starting to at least propose. Those are all ideas that started in the state of California. So yes, what happens in California does not stay in California. I think it's important to note and look uh, at a few things. Number one, I think it's important for folks to, first and foremost, look look at those legislators in your state that call themselves, quote unquote, pro-gun. Because there are many legislators on, on, there are many who, who call themselves pro-gun, but they're not really well informed on the issue. Mm-hmm. And so with a lot of this, this, this media pressure to be, you know, find out a way, come up with a way to be anti-gun and pro-gun at the same time, to come up with pro-gun gun control, things like red flag laws. That's where you're starting to see folks like John Kasich. You're starting to see both senators from, uh, both senators from Florida, uh, as well as a number of other legislators now saying, well, what are some ways I can be pro-gun and anti-gun at the same time or pro-gun and institute gun control? Uh, so it's important for you to number one, hold them accountable. The people who claim to be on your side, you need to hold them accountable when they vote poorly. You want to make sure to hold them accountable. The other thing is one of the things you're going to start to see is groups like every town and Michael Bloomberg, they're spending a lot of money doing polling, doing research to find out what ideas, what gun control ideas and what buzzwords work in various different States. They are then working to try and, and then they're spending money to help elect candidates who are willing to use those buzzwords, who are willing to institute those ideas. And then they're turning around and then they're introducing the legislation. They have a lot of money and they're, they're taking the, the, the long path, shall we say. Uh, and they're not going to stop until they've invest, until they've, until they've accomplished what it is that they've set forth to accomplish. So watching out for those sorts of efforts as well. I often say that the other side has become incredibly savvy, more so than I think they've ever been before. Uh, and maybe it's, maybe not more savvy just in general, but more savvy with with social media and things like that and honestly they're they're getting a lot of ideas now clearly they they're being um guided by people who know about firearms and things like that because some of the some of the things that they haven't known in the past they seem to know these days they've become much better at it like you just said they're doing the the research on what gun control is palatable by everyday americans or you know what gun control can they phrase in a certain way that makes it more palatable i think that more than anything, they are more dangerous to us and our gun rights than they've ever been before. You mentioned holding the politicians accountable, and I would like to talk about the best ways, in your opinion, to actually do so. Well, the first thing, the first thing is, if legislators are not talking about gun, if they're not talk, if they're not actively and vocally pro Second Amendment, like one of the things we've seen here in the state of California is some of these members, these bills come up and they may vote right. But they don't say anything. They don't speak to the bill and, and they don't talk about the, the issue. They just, they, once again, they just seem to be silent. Yeah. Uh, where you have some groups that, uh, one group in particular here in California, gun owners of California, they've opted that, look, if you are not a pro, if you are not an advocate either, if you're not giving pro gun speeches, you're not talking about the second amendment from the floor of the legislature, if you're not introducing pro-gun legislation, then there's no way you can earn an A on their report card. That's the sort of thing we need to be doing is it's not enough to just not be anti-gun. That's no longer enough. We are under assault. It is time for you to be actively and vocally pro-Second Amendment. And are you speaking politicians or citizens? Well, I'm talking politi- okay. politicians, but, it, but also... Also citizens, and you know, it's important for us to, to be vocal, because what, what one of the other things is, 
a lot of people, when they think of the gun, of gun owners, they think of, uh, you know, if, forgive this might be a, a number, a number of your listeners, but they think of an old, they think of old middle, middle class white guys. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that more women own guns than ever before. People of color, black, white, black, Latino, Asian, are more and more people of color and immigrants are purchasing and owning firearms uh, and, and believers of the Second Amendment. They, you know, it's important for people to know that, yeah, when you start talking about gun owners, you start talking about, quote unquote, the gun lobby. The gun lobby is your dentist. The gun lobby is your garbage man. The gun lobby is the guy at the checkout counter at the grocery store. The gun lobby is your your, your child's teacher. Mm-hmm. We are all gun owners and we all, and we are all supporters of the second amendment. And it's important for us to, to, to let people know that there's nothing wrong with being, vis- with being vocal about supporting the second amendment. As a lobbyist, you get to sit in the room with some folks, some legislators, some politicians, things like that. Have you been led to believe that there's any method of, of sharing our voices as citizens that's more effective than another? I think it depends on the politicians. I think that when you're dealing with, for example, when I'm dealing with Democratic legislators, I am focusing more on the civil rights, on the civil rights aspect of it, on focusing on, cause, cause that quite honestly, they don't care about the technicalities. Mm-hmm. They don't care enough to learn in order to understand why some of the things that to them, having no gun knowledge whatsoever is to them, it's, it just makes sense. But when you understand firearms, then you realize why it doesn't make sense. They don't care about any of that. All they care about is how is this going to make me look? When I can start utilizing examples that is going to make them look bad. Like I I always use, for example, when they start talking about laws limiting the ability to own firearms here in the state of California. The, The first law, the first gun control laws in the state of California were introduced in the 1870s. Uh, to keep Native Americans from owning firearms. And then again in the 1920s to keep Chinese uh, and Mexicans from being able to own firearms. And then 1960s, specifically it was done by both Republicans and Democrats to disarm uh, the black, to disarm the Black Panther Party because, well, we can't have urban black men owning firearms as well. Those are the sorts of things that when you're able to put that in their face, they're like, it, it, it causes them to, to at least step back. And stop to at least re- at least rethink. Okay, how exactly am I going to approach this? Mm-hmm. So, some strategies two A advocates use are lobbying and litigation. How important are both? Uh, well, they're both they're both vitally important, and, and more and more we're finding that if you do not if you do not fight the legislation, uh, then it, it it can impact your ability to impact the litigation. That, that, so that, once again, that's, that, that is the sort of thing that's vitally important. There are some things you're just not going to be able to stop, and therefore, you're going to wind up having to take them to court. The challenge with it is, is that going through the courts can be a very, can take a very, very long time. Especially if you're in like, for example, the, the Ninth Circuit, which is the largest and perhaps the slowest uh, of all of the circuits. It's, you know, we have, we have still have cases that we've been fighting for like five to seven years that are still working their way through the court system. Mm. Wow. And the ninth is known for being just garbage. Exactly. But in a, but, and I'll also say this, there are, the thing is, is that there are opportunities to win there because in the end, because they don't care, the, the other side doesn't really care about the constitution. If you can continue the, once again, continue the fight, we have a, we have a, a friendly Supreme Court if we can just get them to hear cases. Uh, and we've actually even had some, some successes here in the California courts on a number of different instances because they've taken to not just going after our Second Amendment rights, but they've gone after First Amendment rights and due process rights and private property rights, all relating to, all because you decide you want to exercise your Second Amendment rights. Definitely. Just to get back to, to lobbying for a second, and then I want to talk a little bit more about litigation. I think that we say the word lobbying so much, but I don't think that many gun owners and just people that like literally wake up, go to work, shoot guns on the weekends, have fun, love guns, love the second amendment, but they don't really understand how it all works. Can you tell me like, do you, you call these legislators, you set an appointment, you go in, you try to educate them a little bit, and then you come back and report to your, to your audience? Is that, is that kind of how it works? Well, it, it starts off by working to develop 
relationships with some of the legislators in, 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 in where they feel comfortable contacting you when they have an idea. Uh-huh. And they have a piece of legislation that they're interested in introducing. Now, there are some folks who are just never going to be comfortable talking to us about legislation. Once the legislation is introduced, our first step is, you know, I, I'll go meet with them and I'll try to explain to them why this is a bad idea. And, you know, evidently, in, in, inevitably, they'll say, well, how can we compromise? And I'm like, well, in some cases, there, in some cases, there may be a tweak to the bill that might make it something that, okay, this is something that's actually, that, that might not be a bad idea. But in most cases, it's, yeah, this is just, there's nothing that will make it a, be, a good idea. And so then, obviously, as the bill goes forward, we'll take an official position on the bill. We'll submit letters to the committee. We'll lobby members of the various different committees. We'll share with them information about, look, these are the reasons why we're opposing it. Uh, and then you go before committee and you testify when the bill is up in committee. And it's, and then it's, and then it's eventually voted on. So that's kind of, those are kind of all the steps. We, we alert legislators when the bill makes it to the floor. We send, uh, email and fax alerts as well as call various legislators to let them know. And by the way, we have you guys call. We have our, we have our follower, people who are part of the, people who are, are following the work we're doing and are part of our fire missions. We'll work on getting gun owners to call their legislators to, to actually impact the bill. And, and of all the stuff we do, that probably is the most impactful is when, when people who actually live in their districts call them mm-hmm. or, and, and send them letters. Those are probably the most impactful things that happen. We're talking to Craig Deleuze from the Firearms Policy Coalition, and uh, I just wanted to take a quick moment and talk about Hackett Equipment. Now, for all you listeners out there, I just want you to know that Hackett is sending me one of their brand new EDC bags. The reason I'm telling you this is because if I disappear, I just want you to know what happened, because Ava always tries to steal my stuff. And okay, she's not what do you think this, this is, the dark web? <laughs> yes, I do, actually. Okay, yeah, that's great. I mean, I like their stuff, but I'm not going to, like, you know, do away with... Uh... Look, I'm posting a note on my Facebook page that just says, if I disappear, it's the NRA's fault. All right. HackettEquipment.com. Coupon code is... GunFunny20, and that gets you 20% off. 20%? That's right. When did this happen? Uh, I don't know. Months ago? Where have you been? I, I, I don't... Dark web? Okay, yeah. Great. <laughs> We're back with Craig Deleuze from the Firearms Policy Coalition. Craig, tell us about the uh, bump stock lawsuit. Okay, well, the bump stock lawsuit, and this is, you know, I always I always have to start off with this. Because people are always like, well, you know, man, do you really, is, is this really a battle worth fighting? And are bump stocks really worth it? And yes. The first thing that I tell people is, yes. Number one, if we're going to start letting people ban firearm parts, if they ban this firearm part, then they're going to come back eventually and they're going to say, well, we're going to ban another firearm part and another firearm. So, so first of all, let's stop blaming firearm parts for what evil people do. So that, that that's just the broadest part of the issue. But then on top of it, most people I know don't own bump stocks. And most, a lot of people I know don't really want a bump stock. But the problem with the way in which this whole thing is going is this, is the, the Trump administration has told the the ATF to rewrite regulations in order to redefine bump stocks in a way that will allow them to be regulated the same way in which they regulate machine guns. There's a problem with that though. There is already in statute passed by passed by Congress a definition of what is a machine gun. So the ATF doesn't have the right or the ability to to rewrite a definition that already exists that already exists in statute. See, kind of the way the legis- the way the whole thing works is Congress passes the law, that's the legislative branch, and the executive branch enforces the law. Now, sometimes there are gaps. There are gaps in definitions, there are holes, and and what a lot of times will be filled in that in order to provide some more specificity will be regulations that are passed by the various different departments. So so regu- regulatory rulemaking is not something new. But the problem is, is they don't get to rewrite law. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to basically overreach into the into the job of the legislative branch. And so that is the the the, the primary basis of 
the lawsuit uh, that the Firearms Policy Coalition uh, has filed against the Trump administration. And our attitude is this. If we're going to let this president break the law or, or violate the Constitution to ban something that we don't care about, what's to keep him or a future president from doing the exact same thing to ban something that we do care about? Mm-hmm. So, exactly. so much of a deeper issue than anything else. And is, I believe there's a, an injunction that, that's part of this. What is that to extend the 90 days or is it to get rid of the 90 days or does, is it to put it on hold? The 90 well, days to put hold, it, or? exactly. Well, it's to put it on hold. The, the, the we're seeking an, an injunction to put it on hold so that, uh, the law will not be enforced during the time in which the, the litigation is being decided on. Now, part of the process in that is, is they'll determine, you know, what's the likelihood of your being successful in, in winning the challenge. So if we win the temporary injunction, that means that that uh, uh, at least the the court believes that we are likely to win the case overall. Huh. Mm, very interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> jinx. It's like we finish each other's sandwiches. sandwiches. <laughs> oh dang! Yeah, we're so. You good. were supposed to say ice cream. Oh, idiot. Well, okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so have you seen like a, a huge increase in memberships and donations because of you know the growing public discontent with some of these two A advocacy groups? It's funny that you asked that question because I'm getting that question a lot. Uh, yes, we ha- we have seen that you know both our membership as well as contributions uh, to our efforts have gone up. You know that's just you know I, I'm I'm, I'm the, while I'm not here to badmouth any other organization, uh, you know I'll say that we're different, and that's why I, I encourage people. You know you support the organizations that support the things that you believe in. And, you know, the, the organization specifically that we're talking about has done a lot of really good work at the federal level. And mm-hmm. quite frankly, we probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't have at least uh, two Supreme court justices if it weren't for their, their support of that, pre- of the, of the president. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, that that's something that's worth looking at, but, but all of that having been said, it's also important that you support organizations that are pro second amendment. And I always say this, We're not a conservative group. We're not a liberal group. We're not a public safety group. We're not an education group. We are a Second Amendment civil rights advocacy group. We are the true gun nuts. So if if that's what you're looking for and that's an organization that you want to support, one that is willing to be uh, aggressive in support of the Second Amendment, then FPC is the group for you. And I definitely think that, I mean, personally, I donate to FPC, NRA, and GOA. I, I'm a little undecided on, on them and their, their efficacy at this point, but I'm still donating to all three because I think all three are important. And I think that it's important to support multiple legs of a mission. Oh, most, most definitely. And I, like I said, I'm like, you know, I always tell people first and foremost, you know, and also make sure you're supporting your local group, whatever group is active and fighting in your state. Cause right now, every town in Bloomberg, their, their primary push is what's going on in your state. They're realizing they're having more success at the state level and even quite frankly at the, at the county and city level than they've had at the federal level. So. It's important that you're supporting those organizations as well. Yeah. And don't assume that just because an organization is is a national organization that they're going to be there on your local issues. Mm-hmm. Definitely agree. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk for a little bit, but I promise there's a question for you at the end of it. So I think that second amendment fund is like two a kind of advocacy fundraising it is kind of a mire at this point. So first off other two a advocacy groups, And I mean, pretty much everyone, a lot of them do mailings and things like that, that some people would think would be counterproductive. But since I think that the people who actually vote in elections and things like that are usually an older, more affluent group of people. And we can see that in the statistics that those people are are the ones that are really, I'm sorry, that was a 450 Bushmaster that I just shot out of my magazine. But those are the people that are really lobbied to a lot because A, they vote and B, they're usually a little bit more affluent and have some spare money to kind of throw around. So while we hate a lot of the fundraising that kind of goes on, it is a reality that the people who they're targeting are donating money. I think it's a very short-sighted thing to be doing right now because when those people do eventually die off, what are you left with? You're left with the people that you've alienated with your really super aggressive marketing but you kind of have to really super aggressively market in order to raise the money that you guys need to fight. What are your thoughts on fundraising for Second Amendment advocacy groups, and what are the principles that the FPC uses in doing so? When it comes to fundraising, you know, we what we try to do is, is we try to go where our audience is. 
our audience is generally tended to be younger. Uh, it's generally tended to be people who are connected digitally. So we do most, almost, we do almost all of our fundraising online, whether it's through emails or whether it's through social media. Uh, that's where the, predominantly we, we raise funds. We, we largely fo- function off of small contributions, as do most of most 2A organizations. Even the largest, the NRA, the largest bulk of their resources come from individual, small individual contributions. My attitude, our attitude is, is we try to get people to fund specific efforts. We're, we're fighting a, spe- a specific thing. We'd like you to contribute to help us fight this, this particular thing, whether it's a lawsuit or whether we're fighting against a particular piece of legislation. Uh, those are the sort, you know, those are things we'll tell you that we're doing. We try to, and one of the reasons for our whole video program is to show people the work that we're doing, to show them that, you know, when you make a contribution, it's not just going into some nebulous thing. It's helping to pay for this individual to be at the legislature that day. It's paying for, uh, these emails that are going forward or these, these letters that are going to the state legislature. It's paying for this specific lawsuit, trying to make sure that you're showing people what their investment is going into uh, so that they can see, once again, see the work, see the work that you're doing. We will always ask and my, and I know some people get frustrated because they're like, man, why does it sound like these groups are always asking for money? It's because we're always needing money. We don't have a Michael Bloomberg contributing, you know, dropping $10 million on us every year. Uh, like, like some of the, the other, like some of the other uh, anti, like the anti-gun organizations do. So we constantly have to be asking, and and my whole belief with folks is this: if you ha- if you can afford it, throw a few shekels our way. If you can't afford it, spread the word. Mm-hmm. Let other let other people know, and that's where people can be active. You can everyone can give something. They can give they can give of their time, or maybe maybe if they don't have a lot of time, they can give uh, of their resources. And quite frankly, it, it's like it's like it's like this: it's if. You can't afford to go to the legislature if you and, and, and or if you can't afford to take the time to read and analyze the legislation and then call legislators or write legislators, then invest in someone who can do that for you, who you trust to do that for you. And so that's kind of that, that that's kind of our philosophy at the Farms Policy Coalition. Well put. Changing it up a little bit, uh, so the whole like attitude, you know, shall not comply. When is enough enough? And do you think that's realistic? Well, I will tell, I'll tell you this, and this is, I am, I will, I am not a person who will ever encourage people to not comply with the law. I think that's an individual decision that individual gun owners need to make for themselves. And I believe it needs to be an informed decision because non-compliance comes with consequences. You need to, you need to be prepared for the fact that are you okay with the fact that you may, uh, at the very least, lose your firearm or firearms that had to depending on how much you have invested in them. Are you okay with the fact that you may have to spend tens of thousands of dollars on an attorney? Are you okay with the fact that you may spend time in jail? Those are, or, or, in, or in some cases that, you know, non-compliance could, could equal an altercation with law enforcement. Those are all things that I think that anybody who says they're not going to comply needs to consider. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. This is an interesting question from one of our listeners. And, you know, on first glance, I, I was like, eh, but then I read it and kind of thought about it. It's, it's pretty interesting. Why don't people from the Firearms Policy Coalition and Gun Owners of America, Second Amendment Foundation, whatever advocacy groups they are, start running for the NRA board of directors? Uh, I can, I can tell you that people that we support and people that we believe in are running for the NRA board of directors. I, I think that the NRA is one direction. I think one of the advantages, for example, we have as a firearms policy coalition, being smaller, it gives us the ability to to maneuver more quickly. We may not have the impact. Like I said, they're more like a, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, what's the word I'm looking for? They're like an aircraft. They're like an yeah. aircraft carrier, and we're like a destroyer. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we have the ability to do certain things that they can't do and maneuver in a way in which they can't. And they have the ability to do things and have the, a level of firepower that we're unable to. You know, I can, like I said, I can tell you that there are people who, who we believe in and we support who are, are both on and running for the NRA board of directors. But I also don't believe that having one big, 
one big organization in and of itself is necessarily the way to go. I think that it's important to have a diversity of voices when it comes to the fight for the Second Amendment. Because guess what? We don't all agree on everything. Yeah. And so it's good to have that that kind of that di- diversity uh, even within the issue. Definitely. All right. So I feel like we could sit here and talk to you all day. I just I would love to pick your brain about pretty much anything and everything, uh, especially in our current situation. But wrapping it up, how can people get involved? Easiest way to go to firearmspolicy.org and get on, get on our email list. Now, I warn you right now, you're going to get a lot of emails, <laughs> but. Most of them are going to be talking about legislation that we're doing. It's going to be talking about litigation that we're going to be doing. It's going to provide you links where you can read more and get engaged and be a part of our fire missions and as well as contribute. I'm just going to tell you right now, you're going to get a lot of emails, but it's not like we're not going to waste your time with those emails. Mm -hmm. If that that makes any sense. The other thing is you can go to uh, facebook.com forward slash gun policy. A lot of our stuff is all there. You can see the work that we're doing. Uh, we do various different news links. We also host coffee with Craig there every morning, as well as we're on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube as well. Okay, awesome. Sounds great, Craig. Thank you so much for spending time with us, and thanks for being out there fighting the good fight. We truly do appreciate all the work that you and people like you do and just want to tell you that at every opportunity. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know what? And I, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing, and uh, I'm going to be doing some interviews at SHOT, so I hope you guys will come and be on coffee. Definitely love to. Uh, we'll, we'll hook up for sure. And again, gun policy on Facebook, Firearms Policy Coalition everywhere. And Craig, we will talk to you very, very soon. All right. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, buddy. Bye. All right, Ava. What a sweet young man. <laughs> so it is time now to move into uh, doing some prank calls. But before we do, I think we need to talk about Matador, Matador Arms. Arms. How's that 1022 mag release treating you? You know what? It's actually pretty cool. It is literally sitting on top of the safe in there because I was just messing with it yesterday, just practicing some reloads. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it works well. It's one of those things. I love those products. They're very simple that solve a very specific and unique problem, and they do it so very classily. And you kind of wonder what you ever did without it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I know what I did without it, and I like doing it this way. But you way can't better. imagine your life any other way. Well, I mean, I can imagine a lot of things. Okay. I can imagine my life with like, what if I had 17 of them instead of just one? <laughs> but then you would need 17 1022s. Yeah, I know. That's the whole point. Okay. Yeah, so I could imagine a better life, yeah. but it would involve more of those. No, I, I, I actually do like them. They're they're incredibly uh, easy to install, and that's definitely important. And it just makes releasing your mag so much easier. If you guys want to buy one, go to matadorarms.com, use the code GUNFUNNY10, and that gets you 10% off. Let's get some prank calling done. It's time for prank calls with Malcolm and Gertrude. Honey! Hello, my name is Balthazar, and I'm trying to find out a good way to carry on my motorcycle. Uh, can you recommend anything for me? What state? Uh, South Dakota. Um... Are you going to be traveling outside the state of South Dakota? No, sir. Just driving to and fro. To and from where? Just to and fro. Just around. Oh, just in South Dakota? Yes, sir. That is, go get a $10 concealed carry from the local sheriff. Mm-hmm. Then you can carry concealed on your fire, on your motorcycle within oh. the state of South Dakota. I'm sorry, sir. I believe South Dakota I and can, Iowa only. I, I believe we have a misunderstanding. I have a concealed carry. I'm just trying to figure out the best method of concealed carry on my motorcycle. Oh, where you, well... Uh, what are you carrying for firearm? I carry a 10 millimeter Glock. Uh, it's not really concealable. Um, uh, I weigh 350 pounds. I think I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that funny? Well, <laughs> but when it's concealed, it has to be not visible to somebody looking at you. Um, so what I was thinking, you know, strap it on your, on the outside of your waistband and with a jacket over the top mm-hmm. and you might be concealed. Like uh, maybe um, zip ties or something like that? No, 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 no. Uh, we've got holsters that'll fit that. Oh, I see. Uh, leather, because I only wear leather. Uh, do you carry a, do you wear a belt? Well, I have to put two belts together, um, and then I wrap those around. So, yes, but it's it's not a belt. Okay. It's belts. Well, but you could put a holster onto that belt, correct? Yes, sir, I believe so. Okay. Uh, and then you, your regular motorcycle leathers. Yes, sir. How far down do they come? 
Um, uh, the problem is I it, probably it's need... It's not a short jacket. It's a longer jacket, isn't it? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Farley, but he did an act that was a little bit like it. So I, I got my leathers uh, from a previous member who had died, and they were a little bit smaller. And like I mentioned, I'm a very large man. And so it's a problem that's a little bit smaller, maybe like a shoulder holster or something. They're available. Um, I don't I don't carry those in stock. I see. Is the problem. Yeah, the the vest is kind of small, so it's like fat guy in a little vest. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, um, sir. I, I really do appreciate your time. Okay. You bet. Hope to see thank you. you. Hope to see you at one of my meetings. He's like. <laughs> <laughs> what meetings, Balthazar? Yeah. Uh, okay. Polymer eighty. They're our next advertiser that we're going to talk about. Uh huh. And. You've been busy with all of their, uh. <laughs> I have. It's so exciting. Literally, yeah. Well, every time I'm like, Hey, Sean, you want to get together? You want to go have lunch? Nope. I'm in my gun room working. Yeah. Okay. Balthazar. Yeah. So the Palmer 80s, the, uh, let's see. I just finished my P80CL. Well, except for one part, which is kind of annoying. I always forget the, the guide rod and recoil spring. I know. So what is up with that? Like you think that, okay, you order the slide kit. Why doesn't it come with it? I don't know. Like you would just assume. You well, got, that's the problem is I'm always like, okay, I got assume. the frame parts kit. I got the side parts kit. I got the sights. I got the barrel. I got the slide. I got the frame. I got the Cause magazine. Because we've, we've done this. Trigger. We've done this a few times where we made that, that yeah, mistake. I, I think I've done like eight of them now. And every single time I have to go order that. But anyway. Okay. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> that's neither here nor there. I got to say the, the 940 CL pretty dang cool and it, for the people who don't know that's the opposite of a 19x it's got this 17 slide and a 19 grip wow that sounded like a old pirate song got the 17 slide and a 19 grip and i'm gonna get down on my dirty pirate ship <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool thank you i i i, I take tips <laughs> no sorry no. okay anyway so go check them out polymer 80 has just about every single thing you need to build a polymer 80 i'm not even gonna call it a glock anymore because the only thing it's going to have when it's done is a Glock recoil uh, spring and guide rod. So, Palmer80.com. And use the code GUNFUNNY and that gets you 10% off. Show does. Tactical Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. We're going to talk about the Mars Mars stands for Magazine Advanced Release System. Yep, this comes to us from Rainier Arms, and we actually had a visitor in the studios here not too long ago. Was, uh, he was in town. He wanted to stop by and show it off. I wasn't available, but he showed you. Yeah, yeah, actually. I was cool. like, well, you, you you don't get to see me, but Sean, on the other hand, I hope you don't mind. I'm sorry in yeah. advance, but... Uh, well, it's because I'm sexy 24-7. Other people have to work too hard for it. Okay, well, I don't know who those people are. Yeah, me either. I was just speculating so we got a few of these yeah basically it basically puts like a mag release on the right hand side that's yeah, an ambi glock matic release i don't know the guy didn't you know he wasn't there i didn't talk to him directly he worked with you um and you said at first it felt a little weird right using yeah, yeah so it, it's a clever design uh he's from battle line industries by the way and he's working specifically with rainier arms to distribute this uh, he invented it and he's working with them to, to put it out so uh, it's an extended mag release. So on the on the left hand side of the firearm, you've got the extended mag release that pops out and is a little bit easier to get. But I don't know if you're like me. I literally have to cock the gun sideways, kind of in my hand, in order to reach it. And that's on Smith and Wessons. It's on these Glocks. It's on pretty much everything. In my hand right now, I'm holding a Glock 17. Well, a Palmer 80 17, or well, a Palmer 80 PF 9. Yeah, there's nothing really 17 about it. Yeah, PF 940 CL. N- well, this one's the 940. Oh, it's not. It's the, yeah. it's the, the full size. Yeah. So anyway, extended on the left. And then on the right-hand side, it actually has a, a nice little mechanism that, that ejects the magazine as well. So when I first started working with it, I, w- I would press out and then kind of start to cock it, but then not cock it. And then so I still – So up, when you say cock it, because people, I think, assume, like, you know, they associate it like cocking – Maybe, yeah. you know, so you turn your hand Alter accordingly so grip. that you get your yes. thumb positioned on the mag release on the left hand side. Yep. Alter so, my in- grip. so instead of having to get your hand, it's really hard to explain this on, uh, on audio. Yeah. So instead of altering my grip to hit the mag, re- mag release on the left side of the firearm, you can actually just pull your trigger finger back or you could even use your middle finger to eject that magazine as well, uh, from the right hand, right side of the firearm. 
I've seen a lot of these. What I haven't seen is a bunch of these that are actually pretty clever in their design. Very, very simple, but pretty dang effective. So after a couple minutes of practicing with him in the other room, and he brought multiple firearms that I was able to go back and forth with and use, uh, I was able to pretty quickly uh, get it to where I can press out, come back without altering my firing grip, eject the magazine, load a new magazine, and be back on target really, really quick. And I'm not altering my firing grip at all anymore, in fact, which is kind of a nice thing. And I like it. And, you know, for, for left-handed people, that, that's great. I messed with it left-handed and you can either hit the, the extended mag release on the, on that side, or you can pull your, your thumb down and hit it on the right side. Whatever you want to do, you have that freedom. Ambi stuff is cool. It's kind of like California gun owners. You know, there's tons of them and they're out there and they need ideas and products. It's left-handed people as well. Yeah, which the fire ministry does not cater towards. Nope. So this is the only thing that I worry about is if I train myself to constantly use that, you know, where I'm ejecting out of, on the left-hand side, what happens when I switch guns? Like now I have to put these on all of my guns. Like I just, I prefer to be consistent and constantly train the exact same way. Yeah, but I mean, that, like- it's the same thing like when I load my gun. Instead of pulling down on that mag release, I just pull back on my slide just because some mag releases, you know, are they have uh, a little bit more material that sticks out than others. So I just try to be consistent as possible depending on what gun I'm using. Yeah, no, I, I get that. But, I mean, look, most guns have a different manual of arms in one way or another. Some of them have paddle. The, like the... Mm-hmm. I what, hate the those. VP9 or whatever. I, I hate I those, remember. but we do have a patron who apparently has really small thumbs and he prefers the paddle holster or yeah. the paddle mag release. Yeah. And some of those are fine. Uh, some mag releases are down at the bottom of the grip. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with changing it up, especially if there's one that you use more than anything else and that's going to be your main platform to train on. But yeah, these are 59.95 available at Rainier Arms. And again, Battleline Industries is the inventor. I and think if you guys cool. decide to buy one, Go to gunfunny.com, click on the support us link, and if you buy directly from that link, uh, from Rainier Arms, we'll actually get a kickback from it. That is so cool. Mm, so cool. So cool. So I gotta say, I'm a little happy to have you back, because, uh, Tate did not read the iTunes reviews so well. Well, that's, a, I also heard that. Yeah. It no. was a little painful. Alright, I'm gonna, full disclosure, guys. He's Tate, only 21. Tate did a good job. In, he did. in my absence. Uh, I, I almost did it. I almost said it without laughing. Okay. Just read the iTunes reviews. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Tate, seriously hooked on phonics, bro. Uh, Trini Hope says five stars. Awesome show. Just recently started listening. Subscribed out the gate. Yeah. Not out of the gate, out the gate. So we know she hood. That's what up. Yeah. Uh, you how have, do we know it's a she? Trini. I mean, her name is Trini Hope. Could be a trainee. Tranny Hope. I don't know. Too much Brittany and Regina on this show, I think. Yeah. Yosarian 497, five stars, best podcast. This is easily one of the better podcasts. Good interviews. Looking forward to more calls. When are you going to call Rivers It's Tactical? <laughs> I wanted to, yes, or last week. You think that's a good idea? You think getting Jeremy mad to the point where he starts dropping bodies is a good idea? No, I don't think yeah. that's a good idea. All right. Our next review, well, uh, comes to us from Jan 209. It's five stars. I think this is one of those like compladist kind of things. Ava, are you? I don't, I haven't read it. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, this is not going to go well. A coal in a pile of diamonds found this podcast after elite firearms and training followed me on IG. Seeing Ava on the IG page got my hopes up on another gun bunny page, but sadly I was disappointed by the lack of distasteful content. So that, that's a compliment to you, right? Uh, not really. They called me a gun bunny and then they said that. No, no, that they're saying they expected a gun bunny, but you, you aren't one. So clearly that's a good thing. That's what it's saying. It says another gun bunny page. Yeah. They, they were hoping they saw gun you. funny would be another gun bunny page. Well, no, they're talking about elite. What they, what they're saying is, is that they thought that they were going to get a gun bunny, but they got so much more because you don't post a bunch of distasteful content because you're not a gun bunny, which I think is a compliment. That's not what I gathered. Seeing Ava on the Instagram page got my hopes up on another gun bunny page. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you're right. No, I totally am. That's totally. Uh, very nice. But okay, then, that's that's not bad. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, the next part, not so much. The podcast, though, is great as background noise on my work commute, and I will be catching up on all the episodes so I can listen to the WLS podcast when I'm actually not busy with other things. Oh, well, shit. Oh, okay, yeah. this is so <laughs> awkward right now. It's not really awkward for anyone, uh, except for Jan209, because, motherfucker, you are not the winner. Uh, let's go with... Uh, 
Yosarian497. Okay, Yosarian497. You are the Just win- because they're on my, you know, they're on my level. Like, I want to prank call River's Edge Tactical. I think it would be hilarious. No, never going to happen. Let's make one of our Patreons do it. Yeah, you can do it. That you way, want. if, you know, Jeremy does go crazy and gets his first uh, stateside kill, yeah, uh, it won't be us. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. I, I'm actually We'll okay sacrifice the Patreon. Well, we're doing Jeremy a favor in this case. Sure, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, we are wrapping up. Find us at gunfunny.com. There's links to everything. Think about becoming a Patreon. We're having a lot of fun on our Patreon Facebook page. Yep. And uh, $25 Patreons. Uh, that is Corbin Bonafide, Iraq Veteran, 8888, Charger Arms, Ryan Morrison, and John Snow. <laughs> if you're the king of the Patreons, the person who donates the most every single month, uh, that is two angels right now. I believe 76 bucks is right around where that yeah, is. Yeah, if you, if you donate seven, if you pledge $76, you outbid two angels. And guys, not only do you get a king of the Patreon shirt, but you also get to have us read basically whatever you want. Basically, John from 2A Jewels, he just wants everyone to know that Valentine's Day is right around the corner. Get your girlfriend or wife 2A Jewels. Uh, and it's not like chinksy jewelry. It's made from gold and diamonds. What was that word? Chinksy. Okay. Chinksy. Okay, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, perfect to wear for any occasion. Also, when you put your order, mention Gun Funny, and that gets you 10% off. So awesome. Patreon. Only, only from now until Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Guys, Patreon is a great way that we fund the show and we can do things like afford to hire like one of the best edis- editors in the biz, Kenny Ortega. And we do it with your support and we truly appreciate it. Patreon.com slash gunfunny. Find us on our website, gunfunny.com. All the social media in the universe. Ava does a great, fantastic job of running it. Ava, do you have any final thoughts before we get the hell out of here? I just wanted to thank a firearms policy coalition. Yeah, absolutely. And Definitely. guys, think about becoming a member. Definitely get active within within your community. Do not get complacent because uh there's just a lot of laws that could possibly be coming our way and it just it doesn't look good. Yeah. It, it's going to be a big fight. Uh don't forget that there was an assault weapons ban uh that sunsetted after 10 years. This next one that they want to put into place never sunsets. So, it could be the end of the 2A in the United States as we know it if you don't get off your butt and get involved. Want to send feedback? Suggest a place to prank call? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact.